George Best was a diamond. There was a little flaw there. Right from the start, people, I think, knew that George had got something a bit special about him. He was such a, an unbelievably gifted player. He had a, a quality and he had a control that, that really was un, unparalleled, really. Good looking, a bit like the Beatles, you know, that hairstyle, etc. A thing of beauty, and we didn't get it all. And he didn't get it all either. I know that at the end of it all, the people remember me first and foremost for what I could do on the field. And remember, people still say to me, oh, I remember that day. And uh, hopefully they'll, they'll always remember the football side of it and, and why the crowds came. It was like the passage of a shooting star. George Best's genius on a football field shone brilliantly for some years. And when it faded, left us with those amazing memories. George's story started in Belfast on the 22nd of May, 1946. He was the son of Dick and Annie Best, who lived on the Craigie estate in the southeast of the city. Soon enough, it became obvious that George had a very special talent with a football. There were fears that he may have been too small to make it as a professional. But that didn't stop Bob Bishop, the Manchester United scout, who called Matt Busby to tell him he'd found a genius. Bob Bishop, the scout from Manchester United, virtually turned up on our doorstep one day and asked if I'd, I'd like to go to Manchester United. And it was as simple as that. I was playing football at the top of the street when it happened, so my, my parents called me down and, and explained to me. And, I mean, I was in the days, obviously. I dashed out of the, the house, straight back up to the, the game that was going on at the top of the street, and just ran on. I told all my friends I was going to play for Manchester United. That was it, you know, there was <laughs> no trial period, no signing on, I, it was all done. It wasn't quite as simple as that for the 15-year-old boy from Belfast. He was offered a two-week trial and travelled across the Irish Sea with another youngster, Eric McMordy, to board with Mrs Fullaway in Manchester. But the two kids were overawed by the club and the city and ran back to Belfast at the earliest opportunity. George, though, came back and settled into life in Manchester, writing letters back home to Belfast about his adventures with Manchester United stars. Harry was like typical, you know, lunatic goalkeeper. You know, you don't score against him, whether it was in practice or in, in, you know, in a proper game. And, and Harry was no different. I had been at the top as a player and I was playing in a five-a-side with small goals against a bunch of young kids, 15 years of age. And this kid came up and put the ball past me and I didn't know what had happened. And I thought, you've slipped a bit. And he did it again. I didn't know at the time, but he's thinking, you know, this cheeky little kid, you know, I'll get him next time. Anyway, it happened two or three times. And he did it the third time and I said, son, you do that again and I'll break your neck. If I hadn't been Irish, I think he'd have probably buried me then and there. And he, he, he talked about it in later years. And it was, I mean, to me, it was a, a great compliment. George was joined at Mrs Fullaway's by another future United star, David Sadler, who took these early shots of the youngster who was causing so much excitement at Old Trafford. It's one thing to say um, young boys are going to be good players. It, it's a total different thing to say that they're going to be superstars and world stars, that sort of thing. But, um, you know, right from the start, people, I think, knew that George had got something a bit special about him. As a 17-year-old, George broke into the Manchester United first team and scored six goals in his first season. But the most poignant memories go back to his debut against West Bromwich Albion in September 1963. <laughs> 
the one thing that stands out is the actual running onto the field before the game. Uh, I mean, a tunnel at United is on a, on a high level. You know, you, you don't actually see the crowd until you're about halfway through it, or you see the start of the crowd. So it's like turning the volume up on a, on a radio, where it just got louder and louder. I mean, that feeling will stay with me for the rest of my life. I mean, the hair's in the back of my head still. But once I actually got out there and started knocking the ball around, it was, it was just another game. And I, I did exactly the same things in the first team as I'd been doing with the junior teams. The young Irishman knew no fear and was fast becoming a phenomenon with Manchester United in the first division as they took the title in 1965. Back home too, the boy from the Craigie estate was making an impression. Plans were underway to bring him into the Northern Ireland team. It was Harry Gregg who tipped off the Ireland manager, Bertie Peacock. I rang Bertie's bar and told Bertie about a youngster that was playing at United called George Best. And Bertie Peacock put it down in writing. He gave him his first cap against Wales because of the telephone call I'd made. He'd never seen him play. It was the first of George Best's 37 caps for Northern Ireland. The Manchester United star was fast becoming a hero back home. There was a curiosity when uh, he began to play for uh, uh, United regularly. And of course, when his genius came through, thanks to uh, television, uh, he became the idol. Uh, of Northern Ireland. He could walk in water and George Best is idolised still by many people in Northern Ireland. Whether George was playing for Manchester United or Northern Ireland, the goals and the admirers kept coming. George Best's star was rising along with the talented Manchester United team that Matt Busby had put together. There were established stars at Old Trafford like Dennis Law and Bobby Charlton, but even they were impressed with the youngster from Belfast. He could control the ball. His left foot, his right foot, it was not a great problem to him. He could turn on a sixpence. He could. Uh, he had a, an unbelievable vision. He could tell everything that was happening around. He knew exactly where people were, and uh, and it, that that gave him all the time that he needed to actually express himself. In time, the combination of George Best, Dennis Law and Bobby Charlton became one of the most potent partnerships English football has ever seen. The thing about football, playing in a team like, like we had, the beauty about it is that when you play with great players, the game is easy. I used to think sometimes, that, you know, if I was a Man United supporter, it must, it must be great going down to Old Trafford just, just at this particular time. The fans had to go down because they were afraid that they might just miss that one game where George Best was absolutely sensational. Or where Dennis Law had uh, sparks seemed to fly wherever he was going and it was so exciting. And I scored a few goals as well from different distances, you know, and, uh, and whenever anybody mentions, mentions Best and the Best Law child, I get a little, you get a little buzz, you know, I think, you know, that was great. While his teammates were mostly married, George was a good-looking single man who was becoming a superstar. Thank you. In those days, he spent a lot of time with the Manchester City midfielder, Mike Summerby. Most of the players at United were married and most of the players at City were, were married, so really I'm a single lad in the 60s in Manchester, which was quite amazing, especially for two people like George, who comes from Belfast and I came from Swindon. You can imagine the 60s in Manchester, it was phenomenal. Football was all he lived for, all, the, all this other stuff that was now coming his way and all the adulation and uh, the girls and things were more or less throwing themselves at him. Certainly in those early days, the, the other stuff was just happening and it was almost happening to somebody else. Life as a football star continued at a furious pace, but the fires of fame were always fueled by his remarkable talents on the field. He had pace. Self-belief. He had the most fantastic ability to play football. George was completely and totally nerveless. He was going out onto a pitch in front of 100,000 people as if he was going out on the street to play in the streets of Belfast. He could evade the most vicious of tackles. He was so brave physically. 
who played Chelsea in a floodlit match at Old Trafford, and he, he was hit a couple of times, really hard, you know, and they hit him, and he still stood up, and he kidded the goalkeeper who went to his right, and then he just walked around him and put the ball in the back of the net. He was so tough and brave. Beautiful player. He could score from it all, whatever angle, right side, left side, centre. He was just, just a marvellous player. I always felt like an entertainer out there, and I knew I could get the crowd excited by doing little things like that and trying things differently. You know, if I was playing against a, a player in particular who was giving me a hard time, he was getting stuck in, you know, I would stand on the ball and ask tell him to come and get it off me, and, and it, I mean, the crowd went crazy. And I, and I loved it, you know, it was great. It was, to me, it was pure theatre. I, I did it. I did it on purpose, because I knew it got the crowd excited. In Lisbon, March 1966, George announced his astonishing talents to an international audience. His performance demolished the great Benfica in a 5-1 win, scoring two early goals for United. The Portuguese press were so amazed that they called him El Beetle. Coming back in the plane, he had this rombero, and I'm the fellow who said to him, take it off your head. Take it off your head. Great players don't need gimmicks. And the rest, leave him alone. I said, take it off your head. But it was too late to slow George's life down. No way to control the shooting star. Walking down the streets, you'd see then traffic stopped. People were stopping, old ladies, young ladies, older men, everybody, you know, wherever you walked down. And he just signed his autographs and carried on. He was really, you know, he was really causing quite a stir. But nobody really knew quite how to handle it. My face was more in, in pop magazines than it was in football magazines. It really had become larger than life, and it was starting to, it was starting to frighten me, uh, because really, still, all I wanted to do was kick a ball around on the football field. Both sides of the Irish Sea were captivated by the phenomenon from the Craigie. Thousands of kids, like his future teammate Sammy McElroy, were inspired. He was the best player I've ever seen, and when I used to see him on TV back home, the next thing I wanted to do was go outside and play in the street with a ball. He just had that impact on me. Sammy McElroy was at Windsor Park, Belfast, for perhaps George Best's most celebrated performance in a Northern Ireland shirt, a 1-0 win over Scotland. He tore Scotland apart that day on his own in front of a packed Windsor Park crowd. It was absolutely fantastic. Best performance I've seen. In 1967, there was no one to touch Manchester United, and another league title meant that United and Matt Busby would have another chance to win the trophy they cherished the most, the European Cup. And after the Munich disaster 10 years earlier, the final at Wembley was particularly poignant. Bobby Charlton, along with United's manager Matt Busby, was a survivor of the air crash in Munich. It was what Manchester United had set out to do, you know, many years before, and they pioneered going into Europe and, of course, there was a great emotion for, for Mad Busby because of the accident. It was his players that had died, and here, here was a new set of lads, and Manchester United was going to be all right. It was the biggest game of George Best's life, and he took the game to Benfica. But it was actually Bobby Charlton who put United ahead in the first half. Then Benfica equalised through Grassa, and the final went into extra time. We went into extra time and, and, and they collapsed. Benfica collapsed in extra time. Then the moment of truth for George Best. A chance to put United ahead. It was the decisive moment in the European Cup final. I still have dreams about that, that one, that split second where everything almost stood still for a second, you know, and 100,000 people. I mean, they knew I was going to score, but in that split second between going past them and it going in the net, something might go wrong. And I was going to stop on the line of back here then, and I didn't. I stuck it around. It took, uh, I think it took the rest of the boys about 20 minutes to catch me after that. It was Manchester United's, Matt Busby's and George Best's finest hour but what next? It seemed to me that everyone was saying, that's it, you know, we've done what we set out to do. I was 22, you know, I 
wasn't going to reach my peak for another seven or eight years. I felt they should have been saying this is the first of many instead of this is the one. And I started to have a lot of doubts about what was going on within the club, which hurt me, you know, because Manchester United had been my whole life. Life went on for George, though, which meant some extraordinary moments on the football field and an extraordinary life off the field, too. But George's lifestyle and the fact that his star was becoming increasingly difficult to handle was a worry for Matt Busby. He did everything that was humanly possible. He tried everything. Uh, he talked to me quietly. He screamed at me. He suspended me. He fined me. He put his arm around me. Uh, he couldn't have done any more. He really couldn't. Uh, I was the one that could have done more. But having said that, I didn't have the experience to do any more. You know, it started going wrong when I was 23, 24. I was still only a kid. I, I didn't know what was going wrong. Matt Busby's retirement sent United into decline, and this was reflected in George's form and enthusiasm for the game. By the time that Tommy Doherty arrived at Old Trafford, George was missing training on a regular basis. They both tried to make things right, but before long, it was clear that George Best was on his way out. He was just 27 years old. Tommy Doherty told me about an hour before kickoff that I wasn't playing. And I just said to him, well, if I don't play today, I won't play again. I remember I, I sat there until all the players had gone. I went and sat up in the, up in the stand. I looked at the pitch and I never went back. So that was the end of George's days with Manchester United. He even quit the game for a brief time, which he spent in Spain. In a period of confusion, Best played a few games for Stockport County and a summer for Los Angeles Aztecs, before signing for Fulham in West London, which was the last English club to really get the benefit of George Best's talents on the field. When he went to Fulham, he actually showed glimpses of, a, of what a great player he was. I remember him and Rodney Marsh, uh, you know, messing about during one game on Match of the Day, and, and he, he looked in good nick. He really got himself into shape again. And, and, and he looked as if that's the times that we were talking about as well, that, oh, he could maybe get back into the Ireland side. But it never happened. George was spending more and more time in the USA, where he met his first wife, Angie. He may have been a fading star by now, but George Best still held a fascination for football fans across the world. He was the star turn for Los Angeles Aztecs, San Jose Earthquakes and Fort Lauderdale Strikers. And the USA witnessed the last moments of George Best's footballing genius. He might not have played as well, he might have been on the downward trend, but he filled stadiums. He was still that great attraction to people, George Best. I mean, what more can you say? But not everybody was convinced by George's American dream. The George Best I remember, and will always want to remember, I'm lucky, was between the youngster I met on trial and the youngster I last, last played with in 1967. Forget all the rest. When he finally retired from football, George's life started to drift, and without the game he loved, alcohol tightened its grip. You think, well, why didn't I see it? Why didn't I spot it? Why, why wasn't I able to see it and do something about it? I mean, obviously, as you got more into the 70s, some of it became very public, and, 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 and you know, that, that's when it all became you know, fairly clear what was going on. But I guess by that time, it was, uh, it was a bit too late. The problems mounted up for the superstar, bankruptcy, prison for drink driving, but at the root of everything was alcoholism. It's not a secret, he did have a drinking problem and, um, you know, he tried to get over it, 
it wasn't going to be. At the end of the day, George had an illness, which was a shame, and only, only the people close to him, his family, his wife at the time, really knew what George was going through. In 1995, George married for a second time, but there was nothing Alex Best could do to stop his addiction. And neither could his friends. An after-dinner speaking engagement with Harry Gregg was one night when things went particularly wrong. I said to him, here, you're ready here. He said, yeah, yeah. We got stepped off the platform, down the corridor, and met his agent and George's wife. And I said, get him out of here. And uh, he went to kiss me. I said, get yourself to bed. The following morning, I'm down early in the morning, and George is there as bright as a button. And I just said to him, George, why didn't you show? Why didn't you show the world the true George best? You know what he said? Too late now, H. Too late. 1998. That's God's truth. Too late. But it wasn't too late to give the one-time football genius the recognition he deserved. The honours began to flow. An honorary degree. The freedom of Castlereagh Borough. And after having undergone a liver transplant, a Lifetime Achievement Award from the BBC. George Best. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's uh, wonderful to be here. I'm, I'm glad I'm here. <laughs> I'm glad I'm standing up. Um, I, I don't know what to say. You know, uh, it's, uh, it's a wonderful honour, and uh, I love awards of any kind. And uh, as I say, you know, it's. Uh, uh, if you read reports, I'm, I'm still around. A little thinner, but uh, I ain't going anywhere for a long time. But in November 2005, the situation with George's liver took a turn for the worse, and he died in hospital at the age of 59. Things didn't look good, and, uh, we, you know, we kept going back. And he just felt that, uh, well, maybe we won't be seeing him anymore. Today, my my father has passed away. Not only have I lost my dad, but we've all lost a wonderful man. The legacy of George Best for me is that people. Uh, youngsters like the ones in this playing pitch only a stone's throw from his home can perhaps become players like him. He is their idol and someday I only hope that the legacy left is that someday else will fall on from this part of the world. There was so much, there was so much to give. There was so much to give. A thing of beauty, and we didn't get it all. And he didn't get it all either. I just feel sorry for these little kids at the minute who go and watch Manchester United and they see the stars that are now. And they are a fantastic team, but these kids have never seen George Best. And uh, if they had it done, you know, I think they would have changed that poll when they said that Eric Cantona was the best player ever to play at United. Not at all. George Best was by a mile. I actually think I was the greatest player of all time. Uh, I didn't just play long enough at the top. Uh, but that's, that, circumstances dictated that, you know, and I can't change it. And I, I was lucky, I had 11 great years, and it's 11 more than a lot of people get. Mm -hmm.